Good, there come folks. Good. All right, well, um, I got a few news articles I thought were kind of fun. We got 10 minutes before the official time here. Um, let me move this down. So these guys have hacked the Tesla. And what they did was they found that the lane detector can be fooled by putting little shiny things on the ground, which doesn't seem enormously surprising. But anyway, they're able to trick the Tesla into driving out of the lane into the wrong lane. Uh, when on autopilot. Somewhere back here, I think 128 they had it. Yeah, lane recognition, this is it. There, they put these things on the ground, little shiny things. So that will get people excited, I imagine. Um, and this one was pretty good. This is useful to explain security to a lot of environment, a lot of situations. Um, this is the nuclear plant security in the Simpsons. Anyways, many applications for that. So uh, this is um, one of the attacks that's gotten very popular in the last couple of years. You just email a company and pretend to be someone an executive and tell them to send you a pile of money. And people fall for this all the time. But this is a new one. The company is now suing their employee to pay back the money because they got an email that's, that appeared to ask for a funds transfer and they did it. Um, that is an interesting case. I... And of course, that's the issue. Uh, this is a lot like the indictments that came out a month or two ago against the cyber warriors in Russia who were just doing what they were commanded to while on duty military. And now they are personally um, legally attacked by America for doing that. And uh, the, um, I saw malware Jake on Twitter immediately freak out about this because he used to work for the NSA. And it is not normally the case that a soldier obeying lawful orders is personally liable for doing that. It's sort of a, a strange abuse of the law. And so this also seems like a strange abuse of the law. Uh, we'll see where that goes. There are blockchain dating apps out there, quite a few of them. Um, somehow they hope a blockchain will improve these things. And apparently they're hoping to do something about it. Um, so here's luxury we have to have two hundred thousand dollars to get in and many others with um i read these and some of them actually have some some use of blockchain that isn't completely stupid like this one tries to use artificial intelligence to match people um each time this one here is like gambling ponder every time you successfully you try to match people and if you make it then you get money from the successful matching so anyway it's an idea. I don't know how many of these are going anywhere, but some attempt to do it. That one I've talked about in another class. Uh, this one, Tinder, apparently. People lie about how tall they are on dating apps. So Tinder is going to fix this problem, they say. And the way they're going to fix it is by forcing you to verify your height. And the way you're going to verify your height is you have to send in a photograph of you standing next to a known building so they can tell how tall you are compared to the building. Is that an April Fool's joke, or is it real? I don't really know. This was a couple days before April Fool's. I think it's real, but what do I know? It does sound <laughs> extremely stupid. It would seem to me like you could just stand on a box in front of a building. But anyway, um, apparently it is. I w was not aware of this, but in retrospect, I guess it's clear the problem with dating apps is people put up a picture that's 20 years old or otherwise completely misrepresent who they are. I don't know. How you'd expect to get away with that, but apparently people do. A lot of people are upset about this. There's a debugging feature in Intel chipsets that you can turn on, and then you can see the signals from internal parts of the processor going to other internal parts, and you can even see some of the internal supposedly secret parts. So 
people are all freaking out about it, but of course you have to have physical access to the device and root access to the operating system to do this. So many people are saying this is not a real security problem because you've already lost all security by the time you get there. But on the other hand, there are parts of the internal working of the chip that are supposed to be secret. Anyway, the point of this, of course, is you need that kind of access to diagnose things like Spectre and Meltdown. So it's, um, anyway, it's called Intel Visualization and Internet Signals Architecture. And like many of these things, it was intended to be a proprietary secret and now it's leaked out of Intel. So there may be some interesting consequences of this, although it's probably not quite incredibly clear exactly what it means in the short run. So this guy got caught for swatting and he got 20 years in prison. So, because he actually managed to get somebody killed doing it. Uh, swatting has been around for years where you call the police and tell them to go to somebody's house and say you have a gun and hostages to like bother people. Um, but uh, it is a pretty serious crime. So the Swiss Post e-voting system was designed to have uh, voter verifiability. You would vote, you would get a receipt, you could then type the receipt into a web page and it would verify that they counted your vote correctly and still maintain anonymity. And these people managed to prove that they were able to um, totally forge it. They were able to break the cryptography and create votes which would then falsely claim to have been counted when in fact they were counted for the other party. So that was so bad, they've actually delayed the rollout of it because this hack was so significant. So uh, that's impressive. In the United States, all the um, disclosures for years of DEF CON and everywhere else showing all the voting machines are unsafe has had no effect and anyone can tell. States that care, has, like California, have switched to it. The states that couldn't care less, like Pennsylvania, just keep using the old one and don't care how broken it is. It's very much like the right versus left now, where, where one side has logic and the other side doesn't care. But apparently Swiss, uh, the Swiss system is different. There's a lot of uh, padding oracles, even now, in cipher block chaining, apparently. I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, so, and this is because um, there is more than one kind of padding oracle. We did the simplest kind, but the point is you, you send a bunch of malformed data and you see if you get any difference in the response. And if you do, you are able to use a variety of techniques to feed a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And these are all many attacks. Well, Lucky Seven and Poodle and Zombie Poodle and Golden Doodle and stuff. These are all varieties of ways to do it. And uh, he has got a scanner that will attempt to do this. So he began researching these for the Poodle attack and found, um, so you connect to a TLS stack and you find that the handshake is different depending on different cryptographic flaws and that leads to a padding oracle effect. He finds that the, the step in the handshake at which it stops is different if the padding is wrong than if some other part of it is wrong. So there are more subtle padding oracles than the padding oracles that we did where it just tells you right there the padding has failed. Has failed. And he... Um, so I send in these cases, valid padding with invalid Mac, invalid padding with missing Mac, and so on. With these kind of combinations, he's able to discover padding oracles. And apparently there are still a lot of them. Ah, oh, this one you saw? All right. And... Cloud yeah. players to... Um, VPN. VPN. Yep, they now have VPN on 1111. I haven't tried it yet. But um, that seems like probably a good idea. 200,000 on the wait list. Oh, oh, there's a wait list. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, I know um, some people are afraid that uh, Cloudflare will use your data, but they have no history of doing that. I, I worried about Google using your data with 8888, but as far as I know, they never did. It would be a gold mine. Yeah. And they're in such a good position to be the ones to set up a VPN. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. Your traffic, anyways, you're, you're headed that way, anyways. Yes, I think that's one area in which Cloudflare has always been tempted to expand. But right now, just serve B2B is all they do. And B2C would be a logical growth expansion if they could do it. And this may be where they go. Uh, all right. And all right. So anyway, uh, the midterm grades have to go out tomorrow. So I'll calculate them based on what you've got. There is no midterm exam or anything, but I'll take all the quizzes and projects that are due and add them up and put it. There'll be a chart on um, the online system. on. Canvas showing how, to cal how the grades are calculated. All right, so we're down to uh, one of the more rigidly mathematical chapters. And I must say, I'm very happy with this book. This guy is a real genius. He's the guy that writes the modern protocols and he explains things so clearly. He's explained baffling things that I've wondered about for years. 
like I'm, I'm finally understanding more of P versus NP. I was talking to um, Caitlin about it earlier. It's really nice because I've heard this stuff all my life. This is the baffling computer science stuff that I always thought of as impenetrable and pointless. And he manages to explain it very clearly. So um, we'll talk about what makes problems hard and the order notation, which I've seen for years, but I've never seen such a clear explanation of what it means. So I'm very happy to learn this. So the idea is you try to determine what problems are hard and what problems are not hard. And so you define hard problems as ones that grow not too quickly as the length of the problem gets bigger. So linear, where if you double the size of the uh, list, it doubles the time to search it, that is considered an easy problem because you can't do anything without it growing that fast. So you're searching through a list. You just take every item one by one and see if it's the one you want. And you stop when you find the one you want. So if you do find it, it takes half N on the average to find it. If it's not there, it takes you all of N to prove that it's not there. And this is a, a fast problem. And it seems like there could be no faster way than this to do it. Um, of course, it would be faster if you had sorted the list, but sorting the list is a much harder problem than searching the list. So you wouldn't gain anything by sorting it and then searching. Um, all right, so here's complexity classes. Searching a list is linear. If you double the size of the list, you double the time it takes. Sorting a list is linear logarithmic. Um, it's, so it's n times log of n. Um, I know one, in a human psychological issue that I heard about years ago in a computer science book was um, that humans are most efficient at sorting things into about five piles. And I used this on the job once. I was doing a, a government-oriented mailing and they had mailed 1,250 letters and one of them is missing. We didn't know which one was missing. And I was able to find it in about three or four hours this way. By sorting them into five piles and then sorting each of the goes into five piles, I was able to alphabetize them and make a computer list and find the missing one. Um, and that's why it's linear logarithmic. You sort into categories, which goes with the log. So you go through the whole thing and sort them into groups. And then you have smaller groups that go much faster. So it's n log n. Um, brute force key recovery is the one we talk about here, the one of most direct importance for cryptography. You have something like encrypted stuff and you have a private key and you're trying to guess it by, and as far as anybody knows, I mean, the obvious attack is just try every possible key. And that would be true to the end. If you have 64 bits, there's two to 64 keys. If you have 128 bits, there's two to 128 keys and you have to try them all. Now you could say searching a list, you just do one equals for each one. And here you do a whole calculation of trying to decrypt it for each one. So you do maybe a thousand times more work per iteration, but here we're only counting the number of cycles and only considering how quickly it grows. That's the very general term of whether this is going to be a possible problem or an impossible problem at scale. <coughs> so linear is order of n, quadratic is n squared, logarithmic is n log n, and all those are considered easy. Exponential is considered hard. And so here's the point, as things get large, exponential grows really fast. These other things grow much more slowly. <coughs> so that's polynomial. Polynomial includes order of n to any power, and all those are considered fast and easy compared to exponential. Super polynomial is anything faster, like two to the n or n two to log n. Um, those are the ones we call hard. And effective doesn't mean that every single problem of this type is hard, and every single problem of the other kind is easy. It means that you can, by choosing a reasonably large n, make this effectively possible, and the other ones remain possible at the same scale. That's essentially what the point of it is. So here's quadratic. Because the difficulty yeah. scales at different rates. Yes, the difficulty scales at different rates, and therefore you can increase, therefore you can create a situation where the problem becomes impossible to solve. And that's the goal for encryption. You want a problem, you want to face the attacker with an impossible problem while still having it possible for the defender. All right, so those are the complexity classes. There's time and space complexity, but time complexity is the one you usually talk about. And so this means uh, if n squared means it, uh, the sum of time take goes up as the square of the size of the problem, and two to the n, the time takes goes up as two to the size of the problem. Space can also be an issue, um, although, all right, and the two are often linked, but anyway, it's certainly the case that there are situations we talked about before in things like hashing, where even though you have enough time to do the problem, you can't, don't have enough memory to do the problem. So it's sometimes space is also a consideration, but most of the time you only worry about time at this level of uh, in principle calculation. And here we get P versus NP, the famous thing. So P is all polynomial time algorithms. These are essentially all the things that can be done quickly on a computer at scale. 
And NP is the non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms, which are problems for which you can verify the solution in polynomial time, but as you, there's not a known way to find the solution in a polynomial time. So it is generally believed that these are very different groups of problems, and the NP problems are really hard, and all cryptography is based on them being really hard, but unfortunately we cannot prove that they're really hard. That is a huge problem. But so the classic one is cryptography. If recovering a key, if you know the plain text, is hard because you have to try all possible keys. It's easy to verify once you find the key, that's P, but finding it is hard. Uh-huh, I see a chat message coming in. All right, what's the runtime for elliptic curve 512 uh, such that they are relatively secured? Um, there are recommendations here. So um, it's not the runtime. The point is, uh, in practice, it is now recommended that RSA should use 4,096-bit keys, although even a 1024-bit key has never been cracked, but people are afraid they might have been cracked by the NSA. Um, elliptic curve, I think they recommend 256 now, or maybe it's 384. Um, there was a couple chapters back we went through that, the official NSA recommendation. So um, those are the ones that are supposedly um, strong enough right now that nobody can get in. In both cases, quantum computers will destroy both of these, but um, they do not exist yet as far as anybody knows. So you have to do threat modeling, of course, and decide if you are really worried about the somewhat science fiction-y idea that, um, that there's going to be a quantum computer. Just a minute, I need to plug in my power. Okay, so let me uh, <clears throat> return back to here. All right. So that's the game here. All right, and so here's the issue of this deterministic versus non-deterministic from I think Wikipedia or something I went and looked. So a deterministic problem, you um, just make a whole series of steps, like you try this and try this and try this, and after a certain number of steps, you find the answer. Non-deterministic problems expand as you go there. You make a choice, and now there's two choices. You make a choice, now there's two choices. The problem keeps growing and getting more complicated. If you think about the traveling salesman problem, this is the point, you start at one, one city, then you go to another city, then you have many choices, many choices. That's what makes them hard. They just expand and grow out of control on you. And um, often they don't even have one unique answer. So it's, um, that's what these non-deterministic problems are fundamentally more complicated. All right, so there are problems outside P and NP. For example, we talked about this before, brute forcing the one-time pad. If you do not know anything about the plain text, if you have one time pad and you try every possible key, you will get every possible string of characters, including other perfectly readable messages, which mean something different. And you have no way to know which of the plain text messages is the right message. So it's hard to imagine any possible solution, no matter how much computer time you have. Um, it, it, there seems to be a fundamental problem here that you can't solve with any amount of computer processing. Um, so that's a very hard problem, not in P and not in NP. You can't get any solution at all. So, all right. Another similar problem is the one that we talked about, why nobody's proven that P doesn't equal NP. Verifying that there is no solution would just also seem to be essentially impossible. You have to try all possible solutions. This would be like all possible algorithms and a class of all possible algorithms would appear to be infinite. So I don't know how you could ever really prove that there exists no algorithm. I think all you could ever do is uh, try the obvious ones and say there doesn't seem to be another good one to try, but I don't know how you could ever really prove that. And that's probably why there's a million dollar prize for proving P is not equal to NP and nobody's got it yet. So NP complete problems are the hardest problems in the class NP. And these are all the same. They all look a little different when you lay them out, but they're all fundamentally the same mathematical problem. So if you, actually, if you ever solve one of them, it'll break all the rest. And so the traveling salesman is the one I've heard so long. If you have a set of cities and a map, what is the best route to visit all the cities in the shortest amount of time? The clique problem 
is where you have a group of people and you're trying to see if some people are friends with others, if they a group of a large group of people, there's a clique of a certain size. And the knapsack problem is where you're trying to put things in a knapsack to have a different weight to match a certain total weight. I, one of these I came across, I think an easy CTF a few months ago was they said, you're trying to make a hacking team. You have a group of possible candidates. Each one has a certain amount of skill and a certain amount of weight and the van will only hold this much. So how do you make the most powerful team? I, I, I was had a difficulty writing the algorithm for it. I didn't know it was one of the famous NP complete problems that are sort of fundamentally extremely difficult to solve. There is no good algorithm for it. Here's the clique problem. You have a group of people that are connected to each other. And the question is, is there a clique of a certain size? And you can see there's a clique of four up top. There's a clique of five in the bottom. You know, for a small thing like this, you can just inspect it. But as the number of nodes grows, this problem becomes very difficult fast, like the traveling salesman problem. Um, so some video games are NP complete, some are even harder, NP hard. Um, and the NP hard problems are the ones that are as difficult as NP complete problems and they suspect they're even hard. Um, it is somewhat disconcerting how much of mathematics is really not proven, how much of what we need is really not proven to any certainty. The math is a whole lot less perfect than I had hoped. Anyway, so this is the P versus NP. Um, so if, suppose you could solve the hardest NP problem in polynomial time. This is the idea. You have slow algorithms that don't work, but then if you're a more smart mathematician, you think the smarter algorithm and get in. So the question is, if you're really smart, could you find a fast algorithm for everything? And maybe you could. Then NP would equal P. Um, most people believe that is not true. So they believe that it is worth struggling with mathematicians and everything else to try to find faster algorithms. And sometimes you can't. And therefore, you have this whole idea of cryptography where you believe that you can encrypt something and the bad guy cannot decrypt it because that's a hard problem and there really is no better solution for that hard problem. That is the belief we have. And that is not based on anything very strong, uh, unfortunately. So that's the issue. Uh, most people think P does not equal NP. Uh, they think that it looks like this. There are the easy problems, the circle on the right in P. There are the NP problems or all the harder problems like factoring. There are the NP complete problems, that group of ones that are all closely related that have this property of growing fast like the traveling salesman problem. And um, then the very hardest ones there are called NP hard. And we hope that NP is quite different than P and therefore things like RSA based on factoring are secure because breaking in there without the key is a very hard problem and, verify, and uh, working with the key is in P. So that's the game. Um, of course, even if it turned out that P equaled NP in principle, uh, most proofs, there are two categories of proofs. I went and read some blogs about this. Um, one category of proof would be the one where you not only prove that P equals NP, but you find some way to find those fast out then that would ruin cryptography. They say almost all proposed attempts to prove that P equals NP are in the category where you prove that in principle there are faster algorithms, but this proof does not in any way help us find it, which is how most mathematical proofs tend to go. They prove that a solution exists, but they do this in a way that doesn't help you find it. So they say even if you were able to prove that P equals NP with that kind of proof, it wouldn't have any realistic consequences. It would still be probably as secure as it is now to believe that even though in principle a brilliant solution exists in practice, it's very hard to find. Anyway, um, so quantum computers change this output by creating a new category of problems that can be solved on a quantum computer. And so that's the new island on this map. This is what the diagram somebody drew for that. They found a, because they now have found a problem that is in problems that can be solved on a quantum computer that is not in problems that can be solved by a classical computer. So this suggests there is another category of P which you will not find without quantum computers. And that, of course, is the issue. And in particular, the ones on which our current public key algorithms exist appear to be in this category, where although they are hard on classical computers, they do not remain hard on quantum computers that run quantum algorithms. And therefore, um, we have to quit using them. So this is the XKCD. There is always an XKCD for everything important. And here's the issue. If you just tell the waiter that you want $15.05 of appetizers, choosing a combination of appetizers to get there is the knapsack problem. And uh, with such a short list, you can do it. But in principle, that problem becomes intractably difficult. And as a matter of fact, he made a mistake in this. There are actually two solutions, which he later admitted was a mistake. 
that you can just get seven mixed fruit, and there is a combination of the other things that will do it. And he didn't intend that, but so apparently even the author of this comic strip couldn't really solve the problem all the way to notice that there was not a, and that is the problem, by the way, but most of these uh, NP complete problems, they do not have just one answer. And that's why they are not very useful for cryptography, because you want to feed in one plain text, one key, and get one ciphertext. You don't want to get multiple answers that'll be hard to reverse. And most of them have that property of having multiple right answers. So in practical cryptography, you would think you want NP complete, but like I say, NP complete is probably not useful because it's not one to one. So what we use is problems that are probably not NP hard. They're not the hardest NP problems, but we hope they're hard enough. So the lattice problems are very important. These are the ones that are going to take over in the post-quantum future. Um, the only NP hard problems that have actually been used in cryptography are learning with errors. There's a group of these things called lattice problems, and learning with errors is the particular one used by New Hope. I'm planning to add a New Hope project for this class. I've been distracted by other projects right now, but I found one I could do where we could make, like, you, you had the RSA project where you used really small numbers. You could see how it worked. There is a similar example of New Hope, but it is sort of baffling. You make these grids, you add noise to the grid, you combine them and get the answer, and somehow the the fact that there is noise in there is what makes it hard. And that's this learning with errors. You have data like an experimental measurement where you measure something and your measurement has errors and you somehow complete the calculation anyway. That's the fundamental issue that makes it a whole different category of problem. And anyway, um, this appears to be the front monitor, it appears to be quite good. It is fast enough to do on hardware and it is not fast, it is not easy to break even with a quantum computer. So we will probably all be going to it soon. In the next few years, one of them will be approved, and we'll have a new uh, recommended public key system, and it will be post-quantum. So the factory problem is the one that works on RSA. So you have a number n that's the product of two primes, and you're trying to find p and q. This turns out to be very difficult. Um, now, prime numbers, of course, are numbers that cannot be divided by anything else. So those numbers are prime, 1, 2, 3, 5, and 7. But 9 is not prime, and 15 is not prime, because they're made of other factors of other numbers. So the prime numbers get gradually less common as you go up in the numbers and fall approximately as the logarithm of the number you've risen up to. So in the simplest algorithm to see if you want to factor a number, if you're trying to find n, you could just try dividing by every number smaller than n and see if it works. That would get you there. That would take two to the n um, calculations. Um, if you have n, if 64 bits, you'd have to try two to 64 numbers. 128 bits, you'd have to try two to 128 numbers. So that would be two to the 256 numbers to break to factor 256 bit public key. So that would be very secure if that was really the fastest algorithm. But there are much faster algorithms. The simplest thing you could do is not bother trying anything smaller than the square root. If you know it's the product of two numbers, if the numbers are both equal to the square root, that would be produced n. So one of them must be less than the square root, the other must be larger than the square root. So you really don't need to try any numbers larger than the square root. Just all the numbers less than the square root is enough to find p. By the convention, p is the smaller of the two numbers. So that's 2 to the n over 2 over n. That's a lot less. 2 to 120 operations for 256 bit n. And by the way, you could also try only the prime numbers less than n. There's no reason to bother trying the non-prime numbers because the non-prime numbers are uh, by definition not going to be the answer because you know it's the product of two primes. So the fastest known algorithm is a general number field SIB. And this is really much faster. Two to the 70 operations for a 1024 bit instead of two to the 1024. That is a monstrous improvement to the 90 for 2048. So this is why um, somebody was asking in the chat, this is why they recommend 4096 bits. The fastest known algorithm for factoring would still take two to the 128 operations or so for 4096 bit key. So, um, however, it also demonstrates the main fundamental problem here, which is that we had an algorithm that was slow, and then we found a more clever algorithm that was faster, then we found a more clever algorithm that was faster, and now we suspect that with the new generation of hardware, something will get faster, and that is the fundamental problem here. We would like to say, no, the bad guy cannot get in, and we are very far from being able to say that. All we can say is the current published known techniques will not let the bad guy in, but there is considerable evidence here that there are faster techniques that just haven't been found yet, and it's possible that the bad guy has them. That's not reassuring. So here's the real experimental results. 663-bit uh, public key was factored in 2005 and a 768-bit key in 2009. So um, people suspect that the NSA can factor 1024. Nobody in the public world has done it, but everybody assumes 
I think based on good thinking that the NSA has super powerful computers and super great theoreticians and decades of research leading them to advanced techniques which are not known outside the uh, classified community. So most people assume they are quite a bit ahead of us. They typically are about 20 years ahead of what's out here as far as we can tell. So that's why people say using 1024 is not good enough if your threat model includes major nation states. So I say, is factory NP complete? Um, nobody knows. There is no polynomial algorithm found. Um, factoring is an, is an NP, but it's probably easier than NP complete, but nobody really knows. <coughs> and here's the algorithm for quantum computers. This is Shor's algorithm. And the point is it uses a bunch of these quantum entanglements. And the quantum entanglement is the bizarre interaction between bits that works only in quantum computers that makes it possible to make a quantum algorithm that goes in a very different way than classical algorithms. And that's why this can factor uh, numbers much faster than any classical algorithm. But the current quantum computers are nowhere near doing anything useful because they are too noisy and too inaccurate and they have too short a lifetime. They need to greatly improve the hardware before they're a real threat. Anyway, so here's the game. You have a problem which is assumed to be hard. And uh, the ones that are typically used are factoring and discrete logarithm. And then you, you assume this problem is hard, and then you prove that your cryptography is as hard as that problem. So as long as this problem remains unsolvable, your cryptography is strong. As we have seen, there is no theoretical basis to believe the problem, these hard problems are actually really hard and will stay hard forever. And considerable evidence that, in fact, they get easier with time as people have more of a theoretical attack. So that's disconcerting, but that's where we are. Of course, that lowers cryptography down to the same security as other areas of life, like physical security with weapons and bombs and guns and shields, where nothing is perfect at all. And you just say we have something that current is considered good enough to considering the current level of attacks, not like it's absolutely perfectly good and will remain good forever. So the discrete logarithm problem begins getting into group theory, and I'm again immensely impressed by your textbook author that can explain group theory so I can understand it. Um, when I was in grad school, I was a teenager or an undergrad school. Like I lived with a guy who was a rock musician and a mathematical genius, and he solved Rubik's Cube with group theory. And I couldn't understand it then. I still don't understand it, but I'm getting closer. Um, so here's what a group is. A group is a set of elements and an operation. So you have, a, and for example, the states of your Rubik's Cube are a set of elements, and the operation is rotating one side. So you have a set of elements and you have some kind of operation that takes one element to another so g prime d star p is the common group these are all the numbers from one to p minus one where p is a prime number not including zero so z star five is one two three four that's a group and it is a group because it fulfills certain axioms and these are the four axioms closure associativity identity and inverse these are the four things it has to have or it is not a group it might be a set a set of elements but it's not a group unless it has these properties Closure is the one we talked about right at the very beginning when I had you doing um, modular arithmetic because you want to stay in the group. So for any two elements in the group, when you combine them with the operation, you just get an answer that's still in the group. You, never, you don't just keep getting bigger and bigger and roll off the end. You, like you have bytes. They go from 0 to 255, and that's it. All the changes just leave you in that group. Associativity means you can change the order of operations in this way, and it doesn't matter. Identity existence means there is an identity element, which when you apply that to another element does not change it. So there's a one somewhere where multiplying by one does nothing. And the inverse is the hard one. This means that there is an inverse. So X times Y produces the identity and Y times X. This is important for us because we're gonna have an encryption key that scrambles the data and we want there to exist a decryption key that descrambles it. If the, there was no inverse available, then you would have a operation that destroys information. Um, for example, and destroys information. If you have zero and zero, the answer is zero. If you have zero and one, the answer is zero. Only if you have one and one is the answer one. So if you have a group, if you have a key that is half ones and half zeros, and you have data that is half ones and half zeros, and you use and as the operation, the end result only has one quarter ones and three quarters zeros. So it has less Shannon entropy and you've destroyed information and you cannot go back. Hashing also does that. You feed in a million bits of data, you get a 512 bit hash. You have destroyed most of the information. There is no possible way to reverse that. So that fails to have this inverse option. So uh, there's your commutative groups. All right, 
um, commutative groups are ones where you can reverse the operation. And there are cyclic groups. Cyclic groups are the kind we're going to use for RCA and other things. This is where there is a generator called G. And if you just take it to the first, second, or third, multiply it by itself over and over, you generate all the elements in the group. All right. So this is the hard thing. The uh, discrete logarithm problem consists of, if, since you have a generator, and by raising the generator to various powers, you generate every element of the group. Therefore, if you give me an element of the group like X, there is a Y. And if you raise the generator to Y, you get X. And the logarithm problem is given X, find Y. That's the discrete logarithm problem. So that is very much like factoring. All right. And uh, we'll do more of that next time as we get into RSA. We're going to play with these. And like everything else, the description in this book of RSA is wonderful and helps me understand it much better than I ever have. And we'll have some examples to work through. Anyway, here's things that can go wrong. Um, for example, if somebody proved the P equals NP and they actually found a way to find those problems, this will all be shot. I think the, the entire logic of cryptography would kind of be shot in principle. Um, so that this people think is extremely unlikely to happen. Most people think P doesn't even equal NP. And even if it does, most people think that in, even if it's true in principle, the solutions can't be found. So unless those statements are incredibly wrong, we'll probably be okay. All that's going to happen is what is happening is the individual algorithms we choose keep falling as a particular problem with that algorithm appears and we come up with another algorithm in the same general class and keep going. That's gotten us where we are. But uh, the cryptographic security of the internet is very much like a ship with holes in it where you pass the hole, another hole happens and you pass the hole. You, you have to constantly adapt all the time, which is not very reassuring. And it also means that all the old data keeps getting exposed. So you have to have these days, if you have some kind of hashing or encryption routine, you ought to have a protocol for rehashing and re-encrypting it every decade or so, or your data will be exposed due to the fact that the cryptography that was considered secure is no longer considered secure. That's pretty annoying, but that has been the case for decades. Then, of course, you can choose numbers foolishly, so they're factorable. Here's a 1024-bit number, which should not be factorable, but this one is not the product of two primes. It's the product of several primes. Some of them are very small. Some of them are equal to powers of two. So, in fact, you can pretty quickly guess them and find them, and once you find them, it gets smaller and so on. So there are numbers which are long that can be factored. Um, if P and Q are not random, then, or if they're near a power of two, or if some bits of them are known, then there are ways to do it. There was a um, easy CTF had a RSA problem with a one million bit key. And I was able to factor it in like a half hour because it was very easy. It was just, all I did was start at square root and go down. And it was the product of companion primes. It was P and Q was only two higher than P. So if you don't choose them randomly, but you make them nearly equal to each other, then of course you can find them. Um, that had a different problem. After I found, after I factored the one million bit key, it took the calculation to decrypt the message was going to take nine days. So I had to find a faster version of Python to get that down to two days and I was able to get it. But it, it, the whole CTF only went for a week. So you didn't have enough time to do the math to decrypt it with the million bit key. But if you used a faster algorithm, you could. So anyway, um, all right. Also, if you have a small n, like 128-bit RSA. Now, this might sound like nobody would do that, but I must say, I myself, until about four years ago, I remember I read the cryptography books, sections in earlier books, like the Certified Ethical Hacker stuff and the Security Plus stuff. And I was really confused how they talked about how 128-bit key is enough. And then you know, RSA, a 1024-bit key is not enough. You need 24-bit. And I said, why are they so different? And I couldn't understand it. And nobody explained it at all in any good way. It took me years to get it straight in my head. But... Um, other people have had that problem too. 128 bits is enough, so they use 128 bit RSA. I think six years ago, I might have done the same thing, thinking, well, 128 bits is enough. Um, you can open SSL, the popular library, lets you make them as short as you want, all the way down to 31 bits. In retrospect, it probably would have been better to put an error message for anything less than like 1024 here saying, uh, you shouldn't really be using this key for anything. But they didn't. It just blithely makes the key and you can use it. Um, and the original RSA paper, which came out in 1978, had this chart to tell you how long the key should be. They put it in digits. They tell you a 512 key is fine. We reckon that N is a 200 digits is a 512 bit key. And they said, look, an 80 digit N is fine. An 80 digit N would take 74 years to crack on a 1978 computer. So that's secure. But if you're paranoid, you can go up to 200, and that would take like a billion years to crack. 
And so it'll be fine forever. This is the problem with this stuff. People didn't understand Moore's law, how computers get a thousand times faster in 15 years. So 30 years later, they're a million times faster. And suddenly a thing that was going to take forever is now within reach. So anyway, there's the default algorithm is 512 for open SSL and everything else. The original paper said 512 will be fine for the foreseeable future. Well, that was not true. So this is the problem. Anyway, uh, then there's, here's the other huge problem. And this is why most cryptographers are very, very, very mad at the NSA and the FBI. They keep wanting to have backdoor. They did this. The United States had this export grade security where they created a whole bunch of products like Microsoft Windows and operating systems and public certificates and everything in a weak export grade version. I remember I used to teach this stuff when I did Windows XP tech support. There was a special version of XP called N and K that went to foreign countries and it only had the weak cryptography. So now that you've done that, there's servers all over the place with the option of using weak cryptography and now you can trick them. So the log jam attack, you get in the middle because the first stages of the TLS handshake are not encrypted. You send a SIN, that's not encrypted. You get a SIN act, you send an act. Then you send a change cipher spec message which says, here's the encryption algorithms I can choose between. Which one would you like? And then the server chooses one. If you can intercept that message, which is not encrypted, and you can say, I'm sorry, I'm MS-DOS. I can only speak 40-bit encryption and see if the server will fall for that. And most servers will fall for it because they have the option of talking to people who purchased the export grade windows that can't talk any good encryption. So unless you really want to write off all the customers in Korea and China using the legally sanctioned version of Windows, you have to allow that stuff. So that's a problem. And there's another one too, which is kind of mind boggling. So if nobody can crack the 1024 bit key, ever, even in a million years, then we could all just use the same prime number. It would be fine because nobody can ever find it anyway. And apparently they did that. A ton of people are all using the same prime number. I didn't know this. But apparently there's a 1024-bit secret prime number. Everyone's using the same number. And um, there's strong evidence that the NSA has had that number all along, and that's how they got to do with this. The, how they prove this. This is also true of elliptic curve cryptography. Elliptic curve cryptography has a couple of numbers used to generate the elliptic curve, and then the NSA and National Institute of Standards approved it and issued the specification. They not only said, use this type of math, they said, use these particular numbers. That's what everybody did. And it was the Microsoft researchers that said, you know, if everybody uses those numbers, that means there is a secret number related to them, which would make it possible to get in. And it is appears to be the case that the NSA knew that and had the number and told us all to use that number because that's their back door in. Although they didn't prove that is true, they proved it was possible. And uh, so anyway, this is... Similar to a lot of people using the same nonce? Yes, that's a similar issue, yeah. Um, it's So it is surprising to me. In principle, these things are very strong if you actually use random numbers, but in practice, a lot of people, most people don't understand cryptography, they just follow standards, and the standards are repeatedly poisoned by the government who wants to have backdoor in. Of course, another way to look at it, which is justifiable, is that this is what should happen. We should not have real security anywhere. Everything should have a backdoor for the government. And the so the real design goal of the NSA and the National Institute of Standards is not to create the strongest security possible, but to create the strongest security with a backdoor for the government. And that is what they have been doing, although they have not openly admitted that. And many people are currently arguing, and this is why the mathematical cryptography types are the ones that are most dogmatic about saying you have to stop this. You have to stop having a secret backdoor because it shatters the whole thing like glass. Um, and the civil liberties people would say that you should instead let everyone have completely strong encryption but no backdoor. And if you have to do a criminal investigation, you should use other means like put cameras in the room, bribe the conspirators, arrest the conspirators, and give them a letter sentence, you know, are other ways to get information besides breaking through the cryptography. Um, that's the current battle we're waging. Anyway, um, I was surprised. Here's how many are vulnerable for this. It's a lot. The top 1 million domains, 17% of them are vulnerable. If this 1024-bit group is broken, log jam, it goes up to like 14% in some systems. A lot of systems on the internet have these broken cryptography systems still in use. So that was pretty exciting to find out. And that is, I think, the, the fundamental problem with everything is everything keeps changing really fast. And so everything old is very insecure. And many, many people are using old systems for a variety of reasons, of course. So 
that creates a lot of holes. And that keeps us all in business. Everybody's insecure, so they hire more of us. And they seem relatively unaware of how useless we are. So that's convenient for us getting jobs. Here comes the Kahoot music. Anyway, I don't think cryptographers are useless. I think you have real value to a company if you can help them choose the right thing and implement it correctly. An incredible number of them implement it unwisely. All right, I don't think there can be very many more. I'll wait another five seconds. And looks like that's it. Oh, okay. Well, wait another few seconds then. Okay. So which is the hardest complexity class? Exponential complexity. All right. Which ones are these the easiest? Okay, P, the ones you can solve in a reasonable amount of time. All right, the knapsack problem, what's that? NP complete. It's one of that group of problems that are all the same, like the traveling salesman problem. All right. How about factoring? What category is that in? It's in NP, but it's not NP complete or NP hard, which is one of the many disturbing things about it. But that's the way it is. All right, how long should your RSA key be? The public key, of course. That's it. These days, 4096 is what you need. Okay, good. So I got M nodes and Beck and Ron. I think those are all close enough to real names that my grader will figure it out. There was one student in the last class who said, oh, my coins have not been appearing, and then it turned out he'd be using a fake name we didn't know all along. So if that happens to you, let me know. There are always, always a few students that I send these in and we're not able to figure out who they are. But these look close to real names. I think Beck is really Becky. All right, are there any questions or anything? Because I'm done with this and I'm gonna just sign off and uh, go upstairs. All right, looks like there aren't. Okay. There's a guest speaker tomorrow night. You might want to tune in for that. I expect to broadcast it on Zoom, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. It will be in room Science 37 at 6 tomorrow. Um, he's coming in remotely, but he looks like a very good speaker. So I recommend attending that one. Farewell.